Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today is a very special video. Do you have what it takes to be a wellness competitor? Am I close enough? Step back, you know? So this video was actually inspired by a message that I received on my Instagram from a woman who was inquiring simply about her potential from a physique perspective as an athlete. And it's conversations that we've had kind of off and on throughout my channel. If you guys are new here, I do specialize in working with lifestyle clients. The majority of the women that I work with are midlife, really just working on body recomposition, fat loss, healthy aging. I myself am a fitness competitor. I've been competing since 2009. I formerly was a figure athlete. I did nine figure competitions. I since transferred into a different federation, competing in fitness, earned a couple titles. I'm a world champion. This is my coach, if you're new here, this is Andy. And if you guys don't follow him, make sure that you follow him on Instagram as well. What is your Instagram handle? Andy Valsich. Yeah. Yeah, just first and last I don't know name. if there was like, we had like underscores, stars, hearts in there. Nothing, nothing just very simple. First nothing and last name, very basic. <laughs> so you do specialize in working with athletes and competitors thought it would be great to just condense everything here do you have what it takes to be a fitness competitor there are a lot of people who are getting into the space now which i think the rise of social media is one thing that's really brought bodybuilding to the forefront more categories overall more federations different options for people and there's also a movement of a lot of older women right women who are even in their 40s and 50s starting bodybuilding for the first time yes and I, you've mentioned to me that you've had a lot more people reaching out to you in all age categories coaching uh, for primarily shows so, in that 40 to 50 range so this was the original question that we're going to go over today and i hope you guys find this interesting if you want to see more videos like this about competing again i do speak more to lifestyle because at the end of the day everyone wants to age well but if you're interested in the competition space we absolutely can do more videos like this on my channel the original question that came in hi victoria I was wondering what your take is on wellness girls. I call bullshit on some of these physiques I see with small, tiny waists, huge quads, glutes, and hamstrings. How is that even possible? I've been training for about three years now in an attempt to change my body for the wellness category. Even with being consistent with training and a pretty decent diet, I still had my waist widen, and this is despite wearing a waist trainer as well as doing some moderate cardio. Wondering if it's even possible to look like these girls competing without being on drugs or having some type of surgery. I'm coming late to the game at age 53, and I've been struggling to grow my quads. Glutes seem to be progressing. As far as my hamstrings, I'm not really sure what to think. Your physique seems more attainable, and you have an exceptional killer lower half. Please let me know what your thoughts are. I feel like I'm going in circles, spinning my wheels, and I'm starting to question myself. If I have what it takes, or if I'm just fooling myself, is this goal attainable or not? And she signs off. I'm not going to say it was. Person, if you're watching this, thank you for the question. I really appreciate it because I think it brings to light a ton of questions that people have about competing. Let's dive in. Let's start with wellness and how okay. she asked, okay, is it possible for you to get a super small waist with big glutes and big quads? So one thing about competing starting out, a lot of it is primarily dictated on your natural shape. Women's wellness was created in 2016 and it was tailored towards women that had more narrow waist with curvier hip. More of the women that naturally have narrow hips and more of like narrow thighs and more of an athletic build would fit better in figure, fitness, physique, any of those bodybuilding categories. And then you go to the women that naturally have curvier hips, more bubbly butts, depending on how muscular they are, would fit better in bikini and then moving on if they're more developed into wellness. So I think before you decide, I don't know if this person was working with a coach or not, or they got advice from anybody. I think the first thing to look at is to have somebody with an expert eye in the bodybuilding space to look at your physique and assess what your potential is, what category would suit you best based off your foundation, what you genetically were born with, because one of the reasons we have so many categories for females I don't know if that's true for men's bodybuilding. It's kind of going that way a little bit, but for females, they really started to segment it out because there were body types that are more gifted in some areas than others. It's not like a stepping stone. I remember when I started, so I started in figure because there was nothing else, by the way, at the time. It was women's bodybuilding and figure, and that was it. That's why I started in figure. But as people started going into bikini, I heard a lot of girls saying, I'm doing bikini like as a stepping stone to figure. I thought, gosh, like I looked at the bikini physiques as totally different. Like I could never, ever <laughs> do bikini. I would have to lose like 30 pounds. You have to really downsize your lats. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to downsize a lot, your whole yeah. lot. So to Andy's point, the first thing to look at is like, which category would suit you best just to start with? And it doesn't mean that you couldn't move that direction. Yep. If you really
really, really were passionate about being one of something else, it just might not work well. You're yeah, you just might not, you might not place well, realistically, like especially in wellness, it's all about what's your waist like? Do you have a wider waist? Do you have a more narrow waist? Okay, more narrow waist and curvier hips. You're gonna fit better in wellness or women's bikini. Now, there have been figure pros that have downsized their upper half to fit into a wellness category. Yeah. And some it's worked out and then some it hasn't. And then you'll have some women that are like a hybrid of both that they do do crossovers. I have athletes that do crossover. Their quads are a little overdeveloped, but the way they pose, they can hide the development in their quads and just emphasize the development in their glutes. So they will do bikini and wellness. Now keep in mind, a lot of this is in the regional level. When you look at the top elite pros, not only do they have an insane amount of work ethic, they've been at it for usually 10 plus years, like bikini at least five plus years and wellness, they've been doing it for a long time. So they have the work ethic, the time, time in the gym, okay, long duration of time in the gym and the elite genetics for that category. So there might be some competitors that are seeing a lot of success in wellness. We're gonna focus on wellness because that was the question. Wellness is like the hot topic because it is the newest. I don't remember what year figure started, but it the started 90s. with, the, yeah, it started with women's bodybuilding and men's bodybuilding only. Then they added figure. And then in 2012, they added women's bikini and men's physique. And then from there, now they've added 2016 women's wellness. So women's wellness is the hot topic right now. Big glutes are in, sweeping quads are in. So that's what we're going to focus on. Younger athletes are just, when I say younger, not just age, but just training age, training age and yeah. competing age may see success at a regional level in wellness. And then when they go to nationals, that's where it's like a real eye opener. Like, wow, like maybe I don't have that specific structure to be that competitive. Maybe you don't want to be that competitive, which is great too. But if you're comparing yourself, if you're getting started and you're looking at like these top level pros, the Yurishnas and you know, the Franciels, you need to look at, okay, do I have similar like structure? Because at the top level, wellness is very based on structure. I think that's one of the most category that I can't emphasize enough, like genetic structure for wellness, because yeah. you really need a really small waist and yeah. really big glute. Taking a step back in terms of training age and muscle, right? Mm -hmm. From a men's bodybuilding perspective, it's very common knowledge. It takes men 10 plus years to put on the amounts of muscle that is required to be competitive, right? And yep. 10 is like a, now you're just getting started, right? You're baby at this point, right? Yeah, for a man like 10 years of bodybuilding, yeah. you should expect hitting it hard, whether you're going from natural, and then if you go further than that, like you're expecting to put on, you can you can realistically, any man with his, with whatever genetics they have, that they really give it their all in 10 years, you can expect anywhere from 30 to 50 pounds of muscle tissue being consistent for an entire decade. Mm -hmm. How that's gonna look on stage, that's where your genetics come in. Yeah, so for females, the other consideration that comes into it, not just your anatomy, is also how much muscle do you need to put on your frame? So say for example, like myself, when I started competing, I was a basketball player since I was seven. I already had some muscle and skills. I had lots of mind to muscle connection when it came to moving around and picking up exercises very fast to be able to learn. So I could jump in and I placed in a lot of my early shows. I won shows early on, but probably in the first couple of years. I remember my first national show back then, there were 50 women in my height class. That's how competitive figure was. These yeah, days it's, yeah, <laughs> these days it's not quite like that because there's so many different categories. But now when you're looking at how much muscle does someone need, a female could take anywhere from, I would say on the bikini level, two to five years. I think for wellness, you'd be competitive, a pro athlete, five to 10 years. And all depends. Of putting on muscle. Yeah, and all depends like height too. So we'll talk about that. Yeah. Figure, same thing. I would say top people, probably only of the muscular ones, right? Five yeah. to 10 years on any of the muscular categories. Categories. Mm -hmm. I think bikini is the only one, which is also why it's somewhat known as maybe, I don't want to hurt any feelings, somewhat of a young person sport, or I would say a young trainee sport. If you're new to training, you can put on that amount of muscle within a couple of years. That's required for bikini. Now for those other categories, you need more time. And then point number two, your height. height. Five pounds of muscle on a 5'1 athlete is going to look totally different than five pounds of muscle on a 5'10 athlete. So this person did not mention how tall she was. Like my height, I'm 5'7". I would say you don't see a lot of wellness athletes that are taller. No, you don't. That are having that shape. I think Francielle must be like 5'3". So Francielle, if you guys are new, she's the wellness three-time Olympian champion, the current champion, and she's an incredible physique. I think she's almost 40. I think she's maybe a year younger than me. And she's been at this for probably at least 10 years. Yeah, she's longer. in her prime. She is absolutely in her prime. To have the comparable amount of muscle, eight to 10 pounds per inch. Yeah, because you got to think bone density is 
as long as muscle mass. So yeah, 10 pounds per inch. So I don't know her stage weight, but I would think most of the girls who I compete against, if they're a 5'3", they're in the 120s range. Mm -hmm. I compete close to 150 at this point in the game. When I started my very first figure competition, I competed at 126, 127. And now I compete at 20 pounds heavier than that about 13 years later. So again, when there's someone's comparing huge glutes and how much poundage of muscle that is on somebody, I would have to put on a lot more pounds of muscle in my lower half to look comparable to somebody who is shorter. Correct, for sure. Yep. So that's a huge consideration. This person says I've been training for about three years. If I put my side-by-sides of what I look like from year one to year three, it's a really good difference. It is nothing compared to what I look like now. now. Absolutely exactly. not that's, even that's, remotely yeah. close. Yep. Still one of my before befores. Of course, yeah, definitely. It takes a long time. So I think there's also this misconception with people getting into the space of how long it really takes. And then also this assumption that if you just throw anabolics at something, like someone's just gonna get huge, right? Which isn't the case. They'll grow a little bit, but it's not the case. Yeah, so this yeah. person also mentioned, I've been pretty consistent with training and diet. So this is another key component. I don't know what the person's training is like. I have all online clients. You have a lot of online clients. People in the gym here, so you see training from time to time. What does it really take to put on the type of muscle that an athlete has at a bodybuilding level? Like the level of like proficiency and training intensity that you gotta bring to really put on muscle when you're getting into year three, year four, year five. Yeah, a lot. There's gonna be outliers to this, okay? You're gonna have some genetically gifted outliers that may be quote unquote like, I'm not gonna say lazy, but you might have one person that has better work ethic than the other person, but the other person is just so genetically gifted and just responded a lot quicker. There is always gonna be outliers. There's outliers in every sport, basketball, football, like there's guys that go to practice twice a day and there's guys that miss practice and still are starting and they're the best athlete on the team. There's always outliers in any industry, especially in any physical sports. The intensity has to be there, but also the proficiency in form, knowing how to properly engage all of your muscles. I've seen people do not 100% like full range, but they still engage their glutes just fine and their glutes grow just fine. Great for them, it works, don't change it. But proficiency in engaging the desired muscle group that you're trying to build is extremely important. And nutrition. And so. uh, yeah, nutrition. Having, having big, solid big build goal. seasons. I know in my earlier years, I didn't have solid build seasons. I would cut for a show and then I would kind of go back to my life. This person might be really consistent for the last few years and you can achieve a lot in a few years for sure. It compounds over time. It's like investing, right? You get a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And then when you actually look at the year 10 gains or your 20 gains, it's, it's a huge number. All of the things are coming together. But that's why photos, documenting your progress week after week, whether it be with a coach or with yourself. You know, a lot of people that don't have coaches, they don't document their progress pictures. So they're yeah. looking at themselves, you know, 10 times a day minimum in the mirror, whether they go in the shower, bathroom, everything, and they can't track progress because you're constantly observing yourself 24 hours a day. So you're not gonna see these small gains. But if you're taking weekly pictures and you go back one year, two year, three year, and you're consistent, you'll surprise yourself. Every coach has discouraged clients over the years. Then you send them a before side and after, <laughs> side by side, whether it be by month six, or month 12, their jaw drops. As long as they're consistent, they're pleasantly surprised. Regardless of genetics, regardless of what they're training for, they're surprised. I think just in general, the idea of how much progress you should have in a short period of time, especially as a newbie, it's like you have these newbie gains and they are, they're great. You should be happy about those gains. You shouldn't say, oh, they're not that great. It's good for what it is for where you're at. The type of improvements and gains that you would expect a top pro wellness athlete or any athlete, you expect a lot more out of them, right? Mm -hmm. You expect a lot more progress in a shorter period of time. For newer people, you're new. There's still so much to learn. And I think as you go further along, we even look at my photos, it's like the changes are, are we're talking centimeters. It's you have to go back and look six months ago or, or one year ago. We look at my photos from three years ago, compare and be like, oh yeah, <laughs> there's exactly. change. I don't yep. have a lot of change from like month to month anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's another really big thing. Wearing a waist trainer, so that's another thing. A waist trainer will not just magically make your waist look smaller and allow you to build your glutes. I think it's a temporary thing, but your waist size is gonna be a lot more due to genetics. Rib cage, like where your rib like cage is. Where the bone, bone is like to your rib gonna, cage. It's not gonna shrink bone. I'm not against waist trainers. It can provide really good waist control, great back support. You have Jen on here all the time. Jen has multiple herniated discs. This helps her back tremendously and it gives her better core control. And it says it provides her better digestion too. If it works, I'm all for it. I'm not ever like just against any modality. If, if it's working for you, I'm 100% I'm 
100% for it. Is it gonna physically take from hip to hip and shrink it down and shrink your actual bone structure? It's not. Your structure is your structure. So I think it's also important to compare dieting phases. So not mentioned in this question was, are you in a dieting phase or in a build phase? If you're looking at a wellness girl who is shredded, just got off stage or whatever, and she's posed, she's gonna look like she's a freaking tiny waist and huge everything else. Mm -hmm. If you are just in your off season or you're a work in progress, you're still cooking, so to speak, your waist might not look too small yet, right? Like it's just, it's not there, yep. depending on what you're eating. I know when I'm dieting and my meals get smaller, that's actually when I think my waist gets smaller is having smaller meals. That is the big thing, yeah. My stomach literally shrinks. I have less food in my system in general. And then as my body fat goes down, I mean, I've gone down to close to 8% body fat and my waist wasn't any smaller than it always is, like no matter what I do. Mm -hmm. It just is what it is. So visually speaking, this is an aesthetic sport. So the best way to make your waist look smaller is to grow everything else, yeah. right? In wellness would be growing the glutes and legs more. I think a little bit a lot. I would train the whole body for sure. Unless you have like an overpowering muscle group in your upper body that you want to atrophy, then I would say, okay, legs off but i would definitely train the whole body and i especially as a beginner i wouldn't really hold anything back even in the upper body department because some people think they have more muscle than they have and women and men can hold fat on their back on their lats primarily and they think they have big lats and then when they cut down they're very surprised like i have a lot of bikini girls that almost look wellness in the off season because of the way their thighs are and they just hold most of their body fat around their thighs and then once they start trimming down their thighs are back down to where that should be for their category yeah what you're comparing yourself to i think is just a big thing like, are you comparing yourself to an Olympian athlete or an IFB pro athlete on stage compared to whatever you look like in your bathroom photos? Yeah. Are you comparing apples to apples? And then even then, like that person probably still has like 10 to 15 years of training on you. Yeah. In this world now where technology at its all time high with AI, the best cameras, There's that the too. best editing apps, the best everything. Yeah. The worst thing you can do to put yourself in like the negative headspace and depression is comparing yourself to others. I know it sounds generic, but you don't realize like these people on Instagram or Facebook or TikTok, the people that you're idolizing, they're probably doing this for a living and they probably are taking the best photos in the best lighting when they're in the best shape with the best angle. And then- And still it, pinching it, yeah. stuff okay. in and, a little. And, yeah, and maybe they're editing, maybe they're not, but regardless, comparing yourself to somebody else with a totally different structure is just the easiest way to fall into a negative headspace. And there's nothing that you can do to control that, okay? Your genetics or your genetic, maybe what, they excel in physically, you may excel in mentally or in some other field in your life that they're jealous of you in that field, okay? So everybody has strengths and weaknesses. We'll say it's all blue in the face. In the world of social media, everything that comes off doesn't appear as real as it is, okay? And there's been plenty of times where me as, as a young fan driving or flying hours and hours states away to go to these expos and meet my heroes. And when I see them, I'm honestly not as impressed as I was when I saw them in videos or magazine. You know, I would see them on the magazine magazines, I'd be like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And then I would see them and they're not as tall as they appear to be or not as big as they appear to be or not as defined. I was very underwhelmed most of the times. All of these athletes are amazing athletes and uh, like top 0.001% of physiques in the world. But I just wouldn't take everything at face value, what you see on the internet. Yeah. I think one of the best pieces of advice I had, I was very fortunate. My very first coach, she was also a figure athlete and competed at Olympia. This is back in 2010. And one of the best pieces of advice I ever got, I'm so happy that she said this to me is I don't remember if it was going into the show week or it was actually I met her outside before going in for the show which she was like do not look at anybody else and don't worry about what they look like at all what matters is what you look like on stage and I was like okay and I fortunately also back then Instagram didn't exist nobody talked about this stuff back then it wasn't like so glamorized and sexy so I didn't have a lot to compare myself to anyway but you, even when you go to an event you kind of look around you're looking at people you're like oh damn she looks good or he looks good or you know whatever and I was just like, nope, blinders on. Yep. Just And I took that with me through all, I mean, I think I've done 14 or 15 shows now. And I never look around and be like, oh man, you know, I'm not scouting their pages and looking at what they look like. And that's the worst thing that you can do because everybody looks different, number one, in magazines, in photos, on social media, edited or not. Everyone looks bigger and better by themselves until you put them next to something else to compare it to. And then even once you see someone backstage, it doesn't matter. It's funny. You're not being no. judged on that. Yeah, I did the same thing when I was competing. First of all, let me just start out by saying if you're starting to work on your physique now, everybody is going to look better than you. You're always going to look in the mirror yeah, and, and, and see something to work on. And, and see your weaknesses, not your strengths. So so I would do 
the same thing backstage. I would try not to look, but you look, people are pumping up and I would see all these guys. I'm like, oh my gosh, like these guys are huge. And then after the show, I'd see the comparisons and I placed higher than a lot of them. And then I'd see the comparison. I'm like, oh no, I look bigger or I look better than, or we're about the same. Or, you know, I mean, they don't look as big as I, because you've been working so hard on your own physique that you're looking at everybody else. And in your head, because it's just such a, a mind game, everybody else looks better than you in your head. And then obviously not every competitor that you coach is going to win. So like after the show, they're really beating themselves up. And yeah. about a week later, their pictures start coming out. And then I get the text like, man, I look really good. It's all mental. Try not to let that affect you. If you're somebody who's just getting into the space, or maybe you've already done a couple shows, it's important to do a gut check. Of why are you doing this? Do you do it because yeah. you generally love the sport? You generally love weightlifting? And yeah, it is a little bit obsessive. I think a lot of people, they have a hobby that they like. For some people, it does become a career. They are really passionate about it. If you're doing it for other reasons, I would maybe not compete or maybe hold off on competing. You should really have a really good perspective on it. So like what you said, it's like you have a higher standard in this area than the average person. I think with that comes responsibility. You have to be able to be an athlete, take good feedback, good criticism, own up to when you're not up to par. When you're competing, 80% on diet does not cut it. We can talk about that. There's a lot of people who think that they're 80%, they're 80-20. That is lifestyle. If you're serious about this, you should be checking all the boxes off and treat it like a real sport or maybe consider doing a photo shoot instead. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. And right? even then, I'm just at least 90%. <laughs> 20%, there's a lot of sabotage to a physique, leaving yeah. 20% on the table from, yeah. uh, from a nutrition standpoint. So really having a good reason to want to do it. I'm really actually very much against the bucket list competitor. I just want to do it just to see what I can do, especially if you're getting into this, somebody who's in midlife. You're putting your body through a lot, potentially your family through a lot. You're having to really make lifestyle adjustments and changes. And if you're not psychologically ready to compete at that level and take the feedback and not be emotional about it, it's going to really mess with you and, and as an adult you need to take ownership of that you are sacrificing a lot to do a show mm -hmm. and not only with yourself but your loved ones around because when hunger kicks in energy levels drop significant other is affected yeah. kids are affected yeah. work is affected you know i i don't know anybody that has worked like a high-end sales job that requires energy and communication skills that has performed exceptionally well the four weeks out of a show so expect to put other aspects of your life on the back burner temporarily when you do a show so what victoria said you know if you decide to do a show don't half ass it because it's a lot we always joke my first coach when if she told me to eat shit, i was like how much Pretty i was so much, afraid yeah. of messing up we're just blessed now to have like all the information we probably have too much information now than before because i used to have to go to borders or barnes and noble encyclopedia bodybuilding i'd go on like kazam or bear share and illegally download like a video of kevin lavrone and i'm like oh he's just eating tilapia and green beans not realizing later on when videos got released he was actually eating carbs so here i am experimenting on all the diets myself with no coach and literally six meals a day i'm literally just eating tilapia and green beans no really? carbs no fat oh yeah i've done it all the 18 hour intermittent fasting pricking my finger to check my ketones doing the keto diet hard back loading every diet i've tried on myself you know before i was a coach and just experimented and some were good some were bad the tilapia and green bean no supplementation nothing went from squatting three to four hundred pounds to like being so depleted by like week 12 i was squatting 185 because i had no carbs, no fat, just nothing, just ran my body to the ground. So it's like, you know, all trial and error, but now clients don't have to deal with that anymore because there's so many great coaches out in the market now and so much great information out now oh, yeah. that um, you're- Almost too much information. Too much information. So you gotta kind of find that happy medium, but you're bypassing a lot of the trial and error when there's so many good people to pick their brain or choose from. When you started and you were like, I wanna be a bodybuilder, like what was your time frame to be competitive? What did you think? Right when I started picking up weights, I was a teenager, but I was bodybuilder boxing at the time and I couldn't hold weight, but I enjoyed lifting weights more. So I enjoyed that pump. I was more drawn to the physical appearance. So I thought at least five years, I was about right. I started weight training at 16. I would say 18, 19, I started to get a little more serious. Diet was still off, but training intensity was really there. Diet was just like, okay, I need protein with every meal and a carbohydrate with every meal. Yeah. And I got a little chunky, you know, but I was bigger and I was strong. So I built that foundation. And then I decided to do my first show in 2012. So I was 22. I, I had been technically bodybuilding for four or five years. I haven't grown height anymore since 2012, and I was a light heavyweight. A light heavyweight at almost six foot is a pretty skinny guy. Yeah. I was like 190 at my height. Now I'm like 280. It was. So how long did it take you to go from? So there? from 2012, it was a big wake up call. I was a light heavy at 193. I weighed in at the MPC Continental in Ottawa, Illinois. From 20, lean. Lean. 
Not as lean as I was at USA's, but lean. 2012, then my next show was 2017. So from 2012, I was 193. 2017, I stepped on stage at 236. So I was a super heavyweight. And then for USA's, I was 240. So that gives you a time frame. So a little over 40, 45 pounds of muscle tissue. And from 2012 to 2017, that was sacrificing everything. That was not drinking at my sister's one and only wedding, like bringing my meal to Laguna Beach and, and watching all my whole family and relatives eat like filet mignon and I'm sitting here eating like chicken and veggies. I mean, I'm talking like extremely disciplined, missed out on my senior prom, missed out on vacations just because I was like, I wasn't going to be able to get my meals in, get my training in. I was just really focused. That's also with a few injuries in there, like a knee surgery in there. That was a road bump that took me out for six months. So it wasn't perfect by any means. And it's not going to be perfect. You're going to have bumps in your journey, whether it's an injury, whether you get the flu, whether a family member is ill, there's going to be some sidetrack in your journey and that's just the way life works in every aspect so it took a lot of discipline and the main thing was just consistency you just do the best you can when i first did the show i looked at a magazine and i wanted to like look like this girl and i thought about competing i didn't have any expectation of winning i wanted to place i was yeah. competitive i did place but that wasn't really my expectation and i knew i had a long way to go i yes. could look at myself and i could look at these other girls and i remember at the time again it was figure so it was definitely the girls that i was competing against so i placed fourth i that was the, prime figure time too. Yeah, Both I know the women figure. who were who placed above me were in their 30s, and I think I was 26. Yeah. They all had great physiques. It was a very softer look back then. It still took a lot of work to get that amount of muscle. So I thought, okay, I probably need like five years. At least I needed five years. Mm -hmm. And I still won shows along the way, you know, local shows and everything. And, and if you're a good athlete and you have a good foundation, good genetics, good training, it's possible. That's the other thing. You don't know who's going to show up that day. But I think just the assumption, and it's almost a little bit of a entitled perspective people get into this and they think they ought to just look like this person that has been doing this for so long and automatically win yeah and everybody and wants to win their first show and you don't know their history again this person's 53 that asked the initial question i don't know what you were doing the 25 years before this yes. like what were you doing from 20 to, or 30 years 20 to 50 i don't know you could have been overweight yep. maybe you were an athlete maybe you weren't maybe you had some injuries maybe you had a couple kids like who knows but that also factors into it are you spinning your wheels and wasting your time i think to wrap it up and for anybody who is thinking about getting into do you have what it takes to step on a wellness stage and compete how would somebody know do you have what it takes is she wasting her time first of all if they have no muscle on their body i don't think we should even be talking about a division or competing in general let's put muscle on your frame see how you look with the muscle on your frame if you're coming to clean slate never been to a gym before let's start working your delts working your glutes working your thighs and see what responds and like reevaluate at least by like 12 months nobody is jumping on stage unless they were a former athlete which that's still not a clean slate because they've been in the gym like a sprinter is going to have phenomenal hamstrings a pitcher is going to have great forearms strong arms a catcher is going to have awesome calves history of sports is going to really develop a boxer is going to have great calves from jump rope we're talking historically on background like if you have a total clean slate we need to see what do you look like with muscle on your frame and then go from there i have girls coming to me housewives that just i'm getting up there i'm you know mid 30s i want to start working out you know i want to start reversing my aging and then they start to see some muscle they're like okay andy I want to compete. We look at their physique and we're like, all right, let's jump into a bikini competition. Or I'm like, wow, your quads are responding really well. Let's wait another year. Okay. Let's keep pushing. And you know what? You're going to fit really well with the way your hip structure glutes are. You're going to fit really well in a wellness competition, but we need more time to like have a clean slate. That's like starting an entry level sales job with a 20 K a year base plus commission and say, I want to be a CEO in a year. Like what? Like see how you like the job first. See if one, you're good at sales, you enjoy the lifestyle of being in sales. And then let's talk about like future plans yeah follow a lifestyle diet yes other people can't even follow a lifestyle diet stay on track yeah and it's like wait till the pressure is on is it, and yeah. it starts getting hard then you really know who's committed and who's really serious about doing this sort of thing so see what muscle you have i think in this day and age you're already doing yourself a disservice by not having a, a good coach to prep you for a show because you're putting in all this time and effort and i think it's a full-time job practically to yeah. figure out the plan figure out what training you should be doing how you should pose how your diet should be manipulated like there's so much that you don't know what you don't know yep, right exactly and because there's such accessibility now to having a great coach why wouldn't you get somebody to guide you in that area exactly yeah. determine if you're ready how long you could 
need to be ready. And honestly, your first show, you're not gonna look like Francielle. Like you're not. And that was the other thing that I had to realize is this is just how you look today. Every show is just like, here's this iteration of me today. And then it's work on it, work on it. And then here's your next iteration. And then work on it. And here's your next iteration. Yep. It's not, you do this and you're done. With all my athletes, everybody wants to win, but I never set expectations on win. I go, we are gonna beat your last package on stage. Cause you don't know who's gonna show up. Still a subjective sports. The judges might like a certain look. You girls or guys might be really close. It's based on opinion at that point. So I just say always on every show you try, try to beat your last package from the previous show. Okay. And then when you said just piggyback off spinning your wheels, don't ever think weight training and building a strong body and, and getting healthy is spinning your wheels, whether you compete or not. Going to the gym, slowing down or reversing the aging process, getting healthy, getting nice and strong and being confident in your body, whether you hop on stage or not, is never spinning your wheels. That's just developing good lifestyle habits that you should carry on for 30, 40, 50 plus years. And again, having the right expectations. One of the problems I think with the industry in general, I don't know if this will ever be solved, is there is no barrier to entry to bodybuilding. When it comes to baseball or basketball or football, these athletes competing at a pro level or even like, what's the level below that? Some like pro or, yeah. semi pros, mm -hmm. they started when they were six. They not only developed their bodies, but also skills, discipline, their mindset, habits that almost are effortless to them, frankly, because it's just who they are. And so by time they're even 30, if they're still playing at that age, playing these sports, they're performing at a high level and they're, and they're executing and they're, and they're incredible. Andy's not gonna wake up tomorrow and be like, I wanna be a baseball player. You, you know what I mean? And like, why am I not at the same level as this person? With bodybuilding, what we're seeing, what we've seen over the last decade is more and more people in these 30s, 40s, 50s who don't have an athletic background, have never done anything remotely like this. Sometimes it's their first time getting into the gym. And I've had women who are 60 pounds overweight call me up and say, oh, I want to do a figure competition in September. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> It's like a whole life change and ignorance, frankly, of not understanding what goes into it. Bodybuilding is truly a sport. It's not just basket weaving as a hobby. It's a sport also because it's one of the hardest sports when I say, not from a skill perspective, but from an attention perspective, because it's 24 hours. Yeah. You know, you have to watch exactly what you're putting in your mouth. Yeah. What's your recovery like? Your training, everything. So it's not just like you go to practice for two hours yeah. and then now you can just, you know, let your hair down and then yeah. not even think about it. Like if you want your best physique possible, it is from the moment you yeah. wake up to the moment you go to bed. If that's something you're interested in and then you keep following a plan like that year after year, your body's going to be improving and then you want to go on stage, you go on stage. If that's not, then you could go on stage, but you're going to be etched out by someone who took it 100%. Yeah. It's not just a few workouts and then and get glammed up. There's so much more to it. I hope that was helpful for you guys. If you have questions on competing on the wellness category, any category for us, or you want to see more videos like this, comment below and let us know if you found this helpful for you. How can they find you? Instagram, Jamie Belson's first and last name, simple. Yeah, so if you guys have questions, you can reach out to me, reach out to Andy, comment below, let us know what else you guys want to see. And thanks for watching.